Welcome back, all of you wastewater enthusiasts, to the Wastewater Enthusiast YouTube channel. We are talking today about composite sampling and grab sampling and all the sampling that we do. What you saw in the opening part of this video was me testing my effluent composite sampler. I was looking for a few things, making sure that it actually took a sample, making sure that it purged the sample when it was done, and then you saw me take the settleometer, put it up to the camera, and show you that it was pretty clear what I was actually looking for was chunks of algae. Sometimes there's algae growth in that line I, that's, that actually takes the sample. It goes outside. I keep it clean. I purge it with high pressure water frequently, but sometimes you know mother nature finds a way and it's time to actually replace the tube. So I don't want my sample spoiled by something that is growing inside a sampler. Always make sure you're maintaining your equipment and that you are actually sampling what you're trying to sample, not something that's living in your sampler okay we a lot of biological processes in a wastewater plant these things can harbor a lot of stuff in them so anyway just a quick note about keeping your stuff clean so what kind of samples are there out there well there's two major types that you're going to be asked about on your test a grab and a representative what is a grab sample about as easy as it gets it's exactly what it sounds like you just literally go out and grab the sample it is that very moment in time take a quick picture you're done uh, the most common form of grab samples that I've seen are bacteriological samples. For a lot of reasons I won't get into right now, but it, once you get a little bit further along in your career, you're going to realize why you don't take composite samples for bacteria. The other type is representative, which is used, we, we get to representation through composite samplers. So what these things do is they take small grabs throughout the day and combine pictures into movies, I guess we can call it, uh, for a bit of a metaphor. I have my particular one here set for every 30 minutes. It's going to take, it says 900 milliliters. That's because it's got a lot of suction lift going down into a 20 foot deep lift station. It actually puts only about this much in there, but over a 24 hour period of time, those little bits add up, add up, add up. They fill, 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 fill. And then when you go to pour your sample, and you'll see me do this tomorrow after this is filled, I shake it real good, I mix it up, and then I take a pour so that you get a good representation of that day. So a, a lot of permits have a lot of different rules and requirements, how often you're doing a composite sample, how long the composite period is. Check your permit. Not all permits are the same, far from it, okay? And also a quick note about this. This is a peristaltic pump. That All that means is that there's a roller in here that rolls against another surface and it pinches this tube. And as it pinches the tube, it sucks. Okay, It pulls a vacuum here and it, and it draws whatever it's trying to draw. Well, I want to talk to you about changing these tubes out. So this will be a quick safety note and talk to your safety officer about all things safety. I'm not your safety officer, but I want to bring this into your awareness. This is what's called a pinch point. Pinch points where people lose their limbs and fingers, okay? Always disconnect. This is 12 volt. I disconnect the battery. You may have 120 volt. Unplug it. Always disconnect your power source before you start working on tubing because these tubes don't collapse. And let me tell you what happens if you accidentally bump that on toggle switch. That's your finger. They go really fast and a little faster than you can react. Maybe you'll be fast enough to get out of there, but not worth taking the risk. Always disconnect your power source. Okay, with that, that's about all I want to talk about composite samplers with you on the, the, there are a lot of different manufacturers and a lot of different types. I don't want to deep dive into the Global Water WS700 <laughs> composite sampler. It's just, there's just way too many varieties out there for me to get specific. What I do want to talk to you about though, is all the different sample bottles you might run into. So why don't we go up to the control room and I will talk to you about the different kinds of sample bottles and their uses. Let's go. Okie dokie, there's lots of sample bottles here. Let's talk about them for a sec. Um, you've got poly and preserved. You've got poly and amber glass preserved. You've got Voa vials and you've got back tea jar here. So you're probably not going to be asked about these. Uh, these are fairly common, but the, the thing that changes with these is what method your, your lab is using. And it really is how much sample they need. So I'm not going to dive into poly unpreserved bottles. Like I said, you're not going to be asked about it that I know of on any exam, but talk to your lab, get to know them. I, it's the bottle I use the most. 
And then over here, this is the one I really want to focus on. These are preserved samples and you will be tested on these. Know what fixing a sample means, fixed. Um, and that typically means it's acidified, okay? And if you're a lab analyst and you uh, have ever seen a sample not acidified, but a base added to it, I'd love to know about it because I've never seen that actually. Please put it in the comments below. I'd, I'd love to hear about that. But you're typically gonna have a lower pH to sequester the thing you're trying to look for. And, and, and that helps with hold times, okay? So know about hold times. That's why you fix a sample. It's not for the everybody's enjoyment. It's because the, the sample needs to get to the lab and it needs to be intact by the time it gets there, okay? So I've got nitric acid here for metals, hydrochloric in here for oil and grease. And I wanna point this out. This is uh, for ammonia, this is sulfuric acid. But look at that, that's a broken custody seal. I, I'm not using this bottle. This came like this from the lab and they, uh, they'll be informed that I, they need to take it back. Uh, if you have broken custody seals, you should not be using them. You may be asked about that. And then here is an intact custody seal um, as an example. Um, okay, VOA vials. These are zero headspace samples. You may be asked about them. I'll do a different, when I, uh, sample at some point in the future, not tomorrow, but in the future, I'll have to take VOA samples. I'll show you what that looks like. It just means you can't have any air, zero headspace, no air in the, in the sample. If they see an air bubble in there, they'll, they'll toss it. And then, or they should. Um, and then here is a back tea jar. This is a very common one as well. What you should know about these is they're hundred milliliters minimum. And that's because of how the MPN is expressed, the most probable number of coliform, colon coliform colonies. I'll get into gross detail about that when we get into disinfection. I don't want to eat up this video with very specific stuff about each bottle. Just wanted to give you an example of the different kinds of bottles that we deal with. A note about sampling. We are sampling to find the constituents in the water. Well, why? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing any of this? You should go and look at the Clean Water Act of 1972. You need to know about that. And you also need to know about the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Look those two terms up. I'll do another video on all the federal laws that have created this industry that we all love to work in and we're all very enthusiastic about. But I, it, it's, it's good to know because you're going to be tested on it. Okay, There's a whole slew of laws and regulations and stuff. So I don't want to eat up any more time on that. I just wanted to put a quick blurb out there. So if you're studying for a test, you know to get to those uh, terminolo that terminology and start committing it to memory now. Okay, so I'm going to stop it for the day. And tomorrow we're going to pick up with our 24-hour composite samples being full. And we're going to mix them up, pour them off, fill out our paperwork. And we're going to talk about chains of custody, chains of custody and labeling our bottles. I will see you in the next segment. Okay, we're back the next day. Uh, sample containers full. This little red light on this uh, tells me that the bottle switch has been activated. So there's a switch in here that turns it off so it doesn't overflow all over the floor. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and pull my composite sampler containers and I'm gonna get ready to sample. But before we get into that, if you're finding any value in this video, please like and subscribe. It helps grow the channel and it helps get this information to people who need it. Okay, so let's start taking these uh, samplers out. I've already got my bottles labeled. I'll show you what that looks like and let's fill up some bottles. Okay, just a real quick note about chains of custody and labeling your bottles. So on here, I'm gonna have, actually this one's a little better. I'm gonna have a project name 
uh, the what I'm sampling, my name, the analysis, uh, the sample date. I haven't taken this one yet, so there's no time on it. And then whether it's a grab or a composite. So apologies for that crease in the labels, just kind of how that one turned out. So why dates and times are important are for hold times. You know, some samples have 14 day hold times. Some of them have six, eight hour hold times. It's, it just depends on what it is. So you need to be very accurate with your timing and make sure that you uh, are, ac are correct because the clock starts ticking when you, when you put your number down on that label and you take the, the sample. So it will correspond on this sheet with the date and the time, uh, the sample ID and the analysis. So I'll bring that up. This is your actual um, legal document. The labels don't stick around. They, they end up getting taken off and, and probably going into the circular filing cabinet. But uh, these do stick around. They, they, they're held for at least three years in California anyway. And uh, you'll see that there's all sorts of sample IDs. HC means uh, 24 hour composite, effluent 24 HC, effluent 24 hour composite. Lots of different analyses. Um, uh, some plants out there do way less than this. Some plants out there do way more than this for every week. It just depends on your permit and your, your discharge requirements. So relinquished by on the bottom, um, you have a signature, a printed name and company, date, time, and then received. So what that is, is the actual chain of custody. I take the sample as the sampler and I relinquish it to somebody. So I'm not the lab analyst. And then in case of today, it's going to be a courier. We outsource to a, a third party lab. We're just not big enough to have our own, uh, pay for the accreditation, pay for all that stuff, uh, the equipment, the, the personnel. It's just, we don't, we don't, it, it, we're not at that scale. And some plants are, I have worked in one plant that was at that scale and it was great to have your own lab. It, it really was, but that's just not how we do it. So the courier will receive it and then he will relinquish it when he gets the sample receiving and sample receiving will receive it and then they put it under analysis, okay? So that's just how the chain of custody works. Um, a, a quick note about accreditation, by the way, in California, your labs need to be ELAP certified, Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. I don't, it could be something different in your state. Uh, if, if it is, please put it in the comments below. I'd love to hear about what happens in your state, but uh, you can't just take your samples to anybody with a, with, you know, say it's a BOD test, anybody with an incubator and, uh, and some, you know, microorganism seeds and, you know, dilution water. It, you need somebody who's been accredited and follows the standards and methods that are uh, appropriate for that test. Okay, so I'm not going to beat the drum too much on that. Talk to your supervisor, talk to your laboratory. If you have one in your plant, ask them what they want. Chains of custody look different. I've, I've, I don't know if I've seen one lab, two labs do it exactly the same way, okay? And I've worked with about half a dozen labs in my career. So just a quick overview on chains and bottle labeling. It's, it's very, very straightforward. Uh, not, we're not launching the shuttle over here. We're just filling out paperwork, but it is important. Uh, these are legal documents, okay? So with that, if you have any questions at all, please, please put them in the comments below. Uh, like I said earlier, if this added any value to you or it was helpful, please like and subscribe so we can grow the channel. Um, these things we talked about today, I have seen show up on all of the certification exams I've taken for wastewater. And some on drinking water, by the way. This is not mutually exclusive to wastewater. Um, drinking water has it as well. There's a lot of crossover with, with some of this stuff. So just, just study it. If you have any questions about anything I talked about today, please put in the comments below. I will demonstrate filling up some of these other bottles throughout the YouTube channel. Just, it's hard to cram it all in one video, okay? So with that, I cannot wait to see you in the next one and have a great day.